Mm -hmm. start this meeting this morning. And it's 10 o'clock on Monday, April 15th. Um, <clears throat> my name is Gail Larson, and vice chair of this committee is Davida Russell. She is here. And I have a group of guests that I um, am happy to see here this morning, and also those two at the end as well. So <laughs> I'd like to read a statement first, and then we'll get... Well, actually, why don't you just introduce yourself, Joe? Go ahead. So my name is Joe DeWitt Foy. I'm here representing Heights Bicycle Coalition. I'm a, a resident of Cleveland Heights, live in the Cedar Lee area, and I have been here for about 10 years and have two young kids at home. And he rides them all over the place. <laughs> I remember his bike. Yeah. Oh, I'm Peggy Smith. I'm here. Um, I'd like to. Um, I'm with too many organizations to mention, um, but I'm here to hear what you guys have to say and um, have a request for bicycle uh, collection. John Barber. I'm pull a chair up down there. Oh, okay. I'm just trying to climate, <laughs> environmental, Thank you. sustainability. No <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, resident of the North of Fairmount neighborhood of our the Church of the Savior. And I will remind everybody to speak up because I have a soft voice, so I've been told I need to project better for the speakers mm -hmm. that are watching. So okay. Go ahead, introduce yourself, please. Hi. Andy Boatin. Sustainability and Resiliency Coordinator. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. My pleasure. Go ahead, Cameron. Sure. Good morning. Cameron Roberts, uh, also representing Heights Bicycle Coalition, along with Joe and Angel. Uh, I'm a Shaker Heights resident, but I work in University Circle and bike commute down to the circle most days, which involves riding through a decent portion of Cleveland Heights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm Reyes Rodriguez. Uh, I also represent uh, Heights Bicycle Coalition. I am a resident of Cleveland Heights in the Royal Heights area. And I've been there for, I want to say, 16 years. <laughs> and, uh, I'm Carolina Wagers. I am part of the Climate and Environmental Sustainability Committee. And I live in the Fairfax neighborhood. Thank you, everyone. I'm excited to have a full table. This is kind of reinforcing me. <laughs> um, April is Earth Month. And we are all charged with thinking about how, how our lifestyles impact our environment, right? Additionally, the administration and council are committed to Vision Zero and Complete and Green Streets. With those initiatives in mind, I invited the Heights Bicycle Coalition Advocacy Committee here today to get a firsthand perspective on their experiences biking in Cleveland Heights. Formed in 2010, their goal is to quote from their rep website, work with community members and public officials to increase bike use, improve safety, and advocate for advancements in infrastructure and policies. We advance the bicycle friendliness of our communities, which you do, through ongoing collaborations that include bike rides, supporting and partnering with others, and advocating for the implementation of safe and multimodal infrastructure accessible for all ages and abilities. I think that's an outstanding goal. And um, I really hope that with the sharing that we're doing this morning that we can better understand the population that does enjoy biking throughout Cleveland Heights and the hurdles that it encounters as well. Not literal, or, well, they can be. <laughs> so um, if you've already prepared a statement, I'd be happy to hear it. Otherwise, I do have some questions as well. So what would you like to do? We don't have any uh, prepared presentation or anything like that. Um, I think we can talk through some of the activities that Heights Bicycle Coalition is planning for this year. Um, I have a couple um, uh, like summary pages of different reports that have been put out, and I can follow up those, um, send the full reports um, via email after. Um, just highlighting some of the, the why um, for why um, biking and supporting bike infrastructure in Cleveland Heights is important. So they touch on um, safety perspectives, um, economic benefits, and then also using uh, supporting biking as a climate resiliency and sustainability tool, um, a, a huge way to decrease uh, greenhouse gases and um, shifting from uh, car-centric design um, and to more of a city that allows people to get around through multiple modes of transportation. Um, it's really, in my mind, is a 
underutilized and under um, appreciated tool for um, progressing on our climate goals. So um, that's another great way, a uh, great reason for why we should be um, working to promote biking in, in Cleveland Heights. Um, I think if we want to maybe start with just some of the activities and things that we're, we have planned. So we're talking about the Tuesday night rides, which will start in June and go um, through October of this year. We'll be publicizing those through our Facebook. And, um, and then we also have a newsletter that we send out um, with any activities that we have upcoming. So we have the Tuesday night rides, but we also have um, various events. We're partnering with Heights Libraries to um, do some group rides and um, more like a bike rodeo. Um, there's some basic fixes. From each tools. library kind of? Uh, this one will be at the Lee Road Library. It's part of their uh, uh, Play Outside okay. event. Um, we started a conversation um, with Nancy Levin about um, potentially partnering over at Noble for the um, yeah. the grand reopening. Yeah. Um, so maybe we'll be able to do something there as well. Um, we are working to get back um, into the schools as well or partnering with the schools. Um, I know that Heights Bicycle Coalition in the past was doing some of that work. Uh, I think with the pandemic, some of the in-person stuff fell off. And so we're starting to uh, try to reestablish some of that. Um, so both doing um, community rides more focused on kids and families, uh, and also doing some um, basic bike maintenance, education, and um, safety training for kids. So um, that's more um, a goal that we're trying to, to get to this year. Um, and then on the advocacy side, so there's a number of events, number of, you know, um, sort of educational and fun, you know, culture building events. Um, on the advocacy side, we're working with each of the four cities in our footprint. So that's Cleveland Heights, University Heights, Shaker Heights, and South Euclid. Um, one of the goals is to get all four cities up to uh, the bicycle friendly community designation by the League of American Bicyclists. Cleveland Heights has been recognized as a bicycle friendly community since I believe 2013. And we've um, been re-recognized each four year cycle. Um, we'll be up again next year, so in 2025. Um, and we're starting to have conversations about, okay, we're at the bronze level now, which is the lowest tier, lowest level of recognition. And we'd really like to push to get up to that next silver level um, recognition. Um, How do you get up there? So part of the application process, you, you answer a number of questions um, from the League of American Bicyclists. They issue, they, they score you, and then, you know, there's a whole rubric around um, policies and infrastructure and educational um, advocacy organizations, et cetera. Um, and then they, they rate you, they give you a tier, but then they also give you a report card and steps to get to that next level. Um, so when Cleveland Heights was last recognized uh, would be 2021. Um, there's a number of um, steps to take to get to that next level. Is that um, posted any place? Absolutely, yeah. It's on, it's um, it's online through the League of American Bicyclists. I can also make note to, to send that one link. Around. Yes, yeah, please. absolutely. Yeah. Um, they're very concrete steps to take to you know progress um, to that next level. There's also comparisons to peer cities that have achieved um, the silver. Mm -hmm. um, to give everyone, or to give those cities a, an idea of what steps to take to get to that next level. Are you optimistic that we can reach that level? I think we can if we if we prioritize that. I think if we if we reapplied now, I don't think the city has changed um, yeah. its biking infrastructure or policies in the last couple of years uh, meaningfully. Um, you know we've past the Vision Zero and the Complete and Green Streets, those were either around that time or a little bit before. Um, but in terms of new or improved infrastructure in the last four years, I don't, I don't think I've seen, seen much. So um, I know I'm optimistic for a couple things that are in the works. So there's a couple uh, planning processes that um, 
Heights Bicycle Coalition and others are taking part in, um, in Cleveland Heights. Um, and I think that would be a good topic to discuss as well. Um, so depending on the outcome of those planning processes and then what starts to get built um, over the next year, then yeah, potentially. Um, so it's more of, it's somewhat in our hands if we prioritize and, and promote and start to build the, the stuff. So um, I would like to hear you just give a, a summary of what those initiatives are that you're working on with the city. Sure. And does that, when the League of Bicyclists or by, what it, what's the national? So it's the League of American Bicyclists, okay. and then it's Do the bicycle go, friendly designation. Okay. Does that go through team. your your organization, or does that come through the city? The city. The city would um, submit the application. Heights Bicycle Coalition. Um, can and does support the cities okay. in uh, filling out the application. Um, some of the questions, some of the sections are about: Are there is there a you know a community organization that is meeting to discuss issues and lead group rides and that sort of thing? So we can certainly um, help out and and support there. Um, we're going through this process now with South Euclid and Shaker Heights. Um, Shaker Heights is in a similar uh, position as Cleveland Heights in that they've uh, been recognized previously and are going for that um, redesignation this year. And South Euclid is going for that initial recognition, um, submitting their application. First one? Well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so they haven't applied previously, so they'll be going for um, at least that, that bronze tier. So. So if you want to go ahead and talk about those initiatives sure. that you're working on with the city as well. Sure. So um, the first one is the active transportation plan, which is um, a, it's a, a planning process between Cleveland Heights, University Heights, and South Euclid to develop a network of um, what are being called neighborhood greenways. So this would be a, a network of bicycle and pedestrian friendly streets that are um, typically off but parallel to the busier arterial streets. Um, so instead of directing bicyclists down, you know, Lee Road or Warrensville Center, you would find a, a parallel route nearby that connects to the business districts and the schools and the residential neighborhoods and churches, um, and business centers, all of that, um, but is a little bit more pleasant, safe, um, and, so and, and not so busy. Um, so we're looking for low volume, low speed routes, um, and then building a connected network between those three cities. Um, those three cities uh, already applied for and received some NOACA funding uh, to implement this. So once the plan is um, proposed, ideally um, approved by um, council in each city, we'd be able to, to start making progress on that. So there's some grant funding already available, which will help to implement phase one, but the entire network will require additional funding um, you know, beyond what's already been allocated. So um, I believe the timeline for that is um, August or September of this year. The plan, the planning process should wrap up and then they'll be coming to um, council for approval of that. Um, the second planning, or is any, any questions on, on that? I, I do. Who, who is in this, I think I missed it. Who is in this planning process? I said like, community members and like you guys or the city? Yeah, so it's mainly that we have a, a big audience. So when you speak, you're speaking to microphones up there as well, in spite of your soft voice, please. <laughs> so um, mainly it is um, city department heads um, from each of the, the three cities. So Cleveland Heights, South Euclid and University Heights. So that's planning and recreation and um, police and fire. Um, there are uh, a few representatives from community groups. So um, Heights Bicycle Coalition is at the table. Um, RTA um, is, is, has been in, involved in the stakeholder meetings. Um, and then there have been a couple uh, community engagement 
Um, there's an online survey and an online mapping tool where people could go in and place you know, danger areas or routes that need additional infrastructure improvements, et cetera. Um, my understanding is there will be an in-person engagement session um, sometime this spring or early summer. Um, I don't have a date for that, but um, and then the planning process should wrap up sometime later this summer. Awesome. Is there um, very interesting? Is there a um, anything on our website where residents can go and show da danger areas for bikers? Not that I'm aware of on an ongoing um, ongoing basis. Um, potentially with the other planning process that I'm going to talk about. Um, they have launched a website and we had one meeting so far, um, sort of like the task force that's, that's helping to, to lead that. Um, and I, one of the things that came up was a tool like that or a, a map where residents could add feedback would be really helpful. And the consulting team that we, that we're working with, has said that they've used similar tools with other projects, so I think they were going to try to um, to implement that. But oh, that would be great. currently, no. No. Okay. Yeah, and I think that that would be really important um, because it's not just you know we had a there was an engagement session a, a week or two ago at the community center for this, and that was exactly what we were doing. We're looking at. Um, crash data and injury data, but then also trying to look at, okay, prior to then, mm -hmm. um, where are people having near misses? Where are people identifying uh, safety concerns? Mm -hmm. And so we were, you know, uh, marking those on a map, but to be able to do that on an ongoing basis and also for people who aren't able to, you know, attend that one-time meeting, mm -hmm. uh, that would be important. Yeah, especially important for bikers. I know as just being a bus driver. Mm -hmm. As the obligation, one of our obligations is to designate and keep the school district aware of any danger zones mm -hmm. or any danger areas mm -hmm. for children or bus drivers to take back to the district. So that would be helpful if the biking community has something where residents and bikers can identify to the city where are danger zones. Totally agree. I might get back on a bike again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could figure out where to drive. Um, that was a CESAP meeting, is that what you were talking about? Um, so the active transportation plan was the first um, planning process I was talking about, and then the CSAP, the CESAP, uh, which stands for the Comprehensive and Equitable Safety Action Plan. That is the second planning process. Say that again. <laughs> the Comprehensive and Equitable Safety <laughs> Action Plan. So hey. the acronym is CESAP, Safety Action Plan. Um, so one more acronym, which is part of the Safe Streets for All federal program. So Cleveland Heights uh, applied for and was um, approved for a $200,000 federal uh, planning grant uh, as part of the state Safe Streets for All to develop a comprehensive and equitable safety action plan. So this will, um, there's some overlap with the active transportation plan, but it goes much further. So it's, um, one of the one of the goals of it is to, you know, Cleveland Heights has passed legislation in support of Vision Zero. Yes. Now this is the steps that we need to take, the priority um, areas, the uh, projects that need to be implemented in order to help us um, actually achieve that Vision Zero um, goal that we've you know already set forth in, in legislation. Did you get a chance to join that group as your advocacy group? So um, Heights Bicycle Coalition is a part of the um, the technical advisory okay. committee um, that's helping to uh, push forward the uh, CSAP, mm -hmm. the Comprehensive and Equitable Safety Action Plan. Wow. So those are the two um, big planning processes related to the work um, that we've we've been doing here in Cleveland Heights. A similar timeline on that one, so I, I believe that planning process will wrap up late summer and will be coming to council August, September time. So those would be the two things for council to uh, be on the lookout for. Um, I don't know the exact plan for you know the presentation to council and, and to be able to ask questions and all that, but summer is going to be the timeline there. Um, so that 
um, as far as the planning process that um, Rights Bicycle Coalition is involved in, um, those are the two ones. Then we're doing some other, um, you know, work to promote uh, bike education and, and supporting just uh, more building that culture and making sure that people are getting out and, and riding and experiencing it. So, um, any, anything you guys want to share on either of those or... Missed. You've done a pretty good job. I guess I just one additional event to promote would be um, as part of National Bike Month in May, we're going to be hosting a bike to work day station on Friday, May 17th, which is National Bike to Work Day. Uh, we're going to be setting up at the top of Edge Hill, uh, so the intersection of Edge Hill and Overlook, and we'll have uh, free refreshments, free coffee, and just various handouts that we'll be handing out to people that are biking by. Uh, so we're going to try to catch a lot of the people that are, you know, bike commuting down into the circle, but then um, anyone that wants to just stop by and say hello and, you know, go for a casual bike ride in the morning is free to stop by and say hi to us. What were the hours for that, Cameron? It will be uh, 7.30 to 9 in the morning. So you'll pick up some commute, quite a few commuters, right? Yes, yeah, that's, cool. that's the hope. Are you keeping data so you get an idea of how many people are doing that? So we, we actually have, I don't know if we'll be counting then, but um, actually this same week we're doing we're partnering with NOACA um, they have uh, twice annual bike and pedestrian counts mm -hmm. at a number of locations around Cuyahoga County um, I guess even uh, beyond Cuyahoga County but um, in Cleveland and some of the um, mainly the entering suburbs but they take they do counts all over but we partnered with NOACA to identify additional um, locations and then um, we've done this we did this we started last year in a more you know formal capacity but um, identifying locations that weren't on their map and um, adding those to the locations and then um, recruiting volunteers to, to go and count bikes and pedestrians so we're starting to get some um, some more data around Cleveland Heights and our other um, communities in our footprint um, and we're trying to identify locations where um, there's either no or inadequate bike infrastructure such that we can start to make uh, a case for it um, and also some locations that are on some of these proposed uh, networks so either the um, the neighborhood greenways network that we were talking about or some of the other um, areas that have been identified to try to gather some pre and post data um, mm -hmm. You know, how does bicycling the numbers change um, after implementation of um, you know some of these infrastructure improvements? So, and we have May designated as the Bike National Bike Month. Mm -hmm. We should be voting on that. Yes, uh, we call it uh, Mary Dunbar. Yeah, so she's started it. Instrumental yeah. in Heights Bicycle Coalition and getting all of this stuff started. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Any questions about what Joe's just discussed? Anybody? Good? I just have a question. Um, I've noticed that uh, there are not a lot of uh, places where people can actually uh, park their bikes mm -hmm. and lock them up mm -hmm. to, if you wanted to go into a, a business mm -hmm. or something to make sure your bikes are safe. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you all utilize the your biking and then be able to enjoy the businesses sure. in the community. And is there not, I don't, I don't know if I see any, I see them in the school, but how do you park your bikes to enjoy the businesses around the community? And is that something that needs to happen where there are areas where you can actually lock up your bikes and go in to have a cup of coffee and, mm -hmm. Coventry did a cool thing. They made it part of their art scape. Yes. So their bike stands, a few of them are situated along Coventry in the business district. Um, Lee Road has a few in mm -hmm. by Stone Oven. There's a few. Um, so there, we do have them, but probably you need more. Yeah. I would say, I would say so. Yeah. I think it has to be a little bit more intentional. A lot of the infrastructure that we have is kind of uh, a um, I thought that just pops in like after the whole, you know, uh, projects uh, are, yeah. you know, done and completed. Uh, but there are some places, uh, I think one of the great things about our rides is that we get to um, 
you know, we, we mentioned earlier that we meet at different locations each time. So it exposes uh, a lot of the greater, you know, Heights area uh, people to our business districts uh, because sometimes we just meet at them and then people just go and have uh, dinner at the end uh, mm-hmm. at those businesses. And uh, this power in numbers, and when there's a lot of us, it's easy to just keep an eye on all the bikes. Right. Uh, but ideally, we will have more places to, to park that are not just like a trash can. <laughs> so can you, can that be part of the data you collect or somebody else collecting it so that we can identify? We're, we're also hoping that as part of the master plan for our parklands for our park system, yeah. that the map that comes out of that not only includes foot trails, but also includes bike parking lots, or, oh, you know, it, yeah. bike racks mm-hmm. are marked on the parkland system map so that when people bike to the parks, they know this part of North Park has a bike rack, this part currently doesn't, and so on, because mm-hmm. that should be integrated into the parklands plan- planning process. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say that, much as I was saying, it's um, the bike parking typically is inadequate and somewhat haphazard. So maybe a business wants to put one out front, maybe not. Um, in certain areas of the city, there are some, um, you know, there there's some locations where the bike parks exist. Uh, more often than not, I usually end up parking to any hunk of metal, mm-hmm. um, which often isn't, you know, the best location, it's right. either not secure or it's kind of in the way. And I always try to, you know, get the bike out of the, the sidewalk or anything, but sometimes, you know, there's not a, a designated location to put the bike. So right. um, I think one thing that um, council could look at and a lot of other cities have done is actually um, implementing um, bike parking minimums or mm-hmm. uh, mandatory uh, bike parking uh, for any new development. So um, I know when Lee Road was um, redesigned about 10 years ago, um, they put in some some bike racks then, um, you know, as some of the other neighborhoods, uh, business districts uh, get some treatments, you know, that can certainly be um, part of it, but for, um, for new developments as well. Um, I've also seen legislation that, um, you know, it's more encouraging of developers, um, but to say, okay, if, if a hundred, uh, parking spots are required for this development, um, a certain number of those, uh, can or need to be bike parking. So, which actually for, from the developer's perspective would be cheaper to put in a, a rack of 10, right. uh, mm-hmm. for 10 bicyclists than another 10, um, car park mm-hmm. location. But do for me some of that sure. legislation, please. Cause yeah. that's what, what Davida and I are all about is trying to make sure that if there's something we can do to support everything the yeah. city is doing, that we can do it through legislation as well. So if there's a need that we can address, that'd be great. Of course, we'd work with the administration on it. Yep. Um, okay. Are we done with it? Because I want to add something to the conversation. I am not sure if you're aware, but um, Future Heist is hosting on April 30th a conversation yes. um, that is how to live mm-hmm. less car centric. Mm-hmm. So I've been lucky enough to be part of the conversations on setting up the survey, and I have read the, you know, we asked the community a whole host of questions. And uh, it's not by any means a scientific data-driven survey, but when I read the results and the responses from the community, I was shocked. And I think it would be really good that groups like yours will attend Mm -hmm. this uh, meeting on the 30th. It's going to be at May Cleveland. Because from personally my perspective about environmental friendly practices, I can tell you that that ranked very low in how the community perceives biking as being important. Uh, Things like... Are you interested in biking? Not many people, only like 30% maybe of the responders. Uh, do you 
use your bike and commute to work, less than 5% of the people. So I think that it's important that we also step up from our fashions and really get a pers perspective of how the community feels about things. Uh, there are people that are incredibly annoyed by bike or by, you know, by uh, biking, bike riders. So I was upset <laughs> when I read the results, but it also made me step back and say, okay, so if people, there are about 60% of people that could be interested on walking more and biking more, the question is what will make them take action. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that would be a conversation that would be interesting to, to have at that uh, meeting um, on the 30th. Yeah, if we can get some, two, three, four, however many people from the coalition to come to that meeting and be part of the small groups, um, maybe making sure that you're spread out throughout the small groups, that would be really, a, that's a great idea, Catalina. Yeah, it really is, so, um, and I hope you can come. Sure. Looking forward to it. The, the whole idea is educating, right? Mm -hmm. And also convincing people that if you're going to go to some, a place three, four, five blocks from your home, you can walk it or bike it rather than taking the car. So, so I'll be there and I am um, helping to kick off the, the conversation. So I'll be great. Nice you to, agreed uh, to be a yeah, speaker? Yeah, so I'll be, I'll be speaking. Joe, so did you read the survey? The results? I haven't seen the results. Um, I filled out the survey, but I haven't seen the results. Yeah, I think probably you want to okay. read them before you go and give your opening statement. Okay, sounds good. It's on Future Heights website, correct? Uh, yeah, I can form to you. Okay. Uh, I can forward you the link. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if they are on the website. I'll check. Two points that um, you made me think of. One, um, Shifting away from a transportation system uh, solely or primarily based on cars is one of the biggest impacts that a, a city can do um, in order to make uh, progress on our climate goals. Um, and I don't think that is widely recognized, um, especially um, you know for people who are interested in um, finding ways to reduce uh, our personal um, you know, emissions um, footprint or moving the city and region forward to a greener, more sustainable future. Um, I, I don't think that is widely recognized that, um, you know, one of the, the biggest tools or levers we have is um, shifting from a purely car-centric design and transportation system to one that includes more walking, biking, public transit, et cetera. Um, and then another one is that um, from an equity side, the um, one of the best things like like if if someone wants to ride their bike, if someone is you know fully dedicated and, and wants to do that, they're passionate about it. They can ride their bike. Um, in order to open that option up for um, we often refer to all ages and abilities. Um, that's where the infrastructure and changes and protection comes in. So if we really want to see more people riding bikes, um, and, and, you know, to that point, not everyone needs to ride a bike, not everyone needs to be interested, but there are a lot of people that are interested or would consider it, um, if it felt safe. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, you know, the bike lanes and the buffered bike lanes and the protected, you know, off route, or uh, off road routes come in, um, and it also doesn't need to be every person for every trip, but even if it's 10% um, or a 5% shift, that's a massive um, change in terms of the um, traffic congestion, the parking required, the emissions um, and the air pollution, the noise pollution, the um, dangers that, that cars represent. So, um, you know, for all of those reasons, um, building out um, more and better bike infrastructure is, is really important. That was one of the, the uh, reports that I have um, talking about how bike infrastructure can be a very cost-effective way to 
progress on a city's climate goals. So I'll, I'll, I'll share that. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? <laughs> Sorry. Um, what is your thoughts on um, the bike rentals where you could see people rent the bikes? And one thing I hated that they were placed in here and everywhere versus being in a bike rack or have a bike rack where if you picked it up here, you had to return it to a place that had a bike rack or the scooters that was being, I don't know what you call them, scooters. What was your, what is your perception on that far as being more less being in a vehicle versus adding that to your biking or not adding it to your biking? I don't know. I've just, I heard a lot of different things about it, some positive, some negative, but what is your perception for the biking world? You have, I mean, you, you work in university yeah, circles. Yeah, I can start. So yeah, I work in university circles. I see them all over the place in that area. And, um, you know, there certainly are some issues with sort of like clutter on sidewalks and how that needs to be dealt with. I don't think that the companies have quite figured out, you know, what the solution is there, but I think they can be a really effective tool when you're thinking about like first and last mile connection. So um, in terms of transit connection. So, you know, a lot of times if someone wants to use transit for a commute to work or to travel somewhere, they might not have a transit stop right outside the front of their house or wherever they live. But if they had a scooter or a bike available that they could hop on to get them there, that could be a way to fill that gap. And then vice versa, you know, when you hop off your transit stop, your, your workplace still might be a half mile walk away. And so those devices can help fill that gap as well. Uh, so I've seen them be a really effective tool for that purpose in University Circle. Mm-hmm. And they're just trying to figure out how to store them once people... Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how to stay in business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Challenge for that. Gail, yeah, mm-hmm. may I have a comment? Yes, um, First of all, I think that the results of that survey did reflect a lot of the fact that we don't have a good infrastructure for in our city. Um, I don't feel it's a safe place. A lot of the, you know, we have all these really busy roads that if you want to get anywhere, you have to get through them somehow. So I think the infrastructure is really, really key. And would, if we had a better one, I think the results of that would, would be very different. Um, I have a, re- a request, and um, it's kind of a sensitive one, of the Heights Bicycle Coalition and the city. Um, and I've made this request to a couple of other people without <clears throat> any effect. Um, there's a, a ghost bike on the corner of Lee and East um, Scarborough. Mm-hmm. I put and, it there, so yes. <laughs> I said I put it there, yes. <laughs> no, I think it's really important to commemorate, um, but it's been four years. Mm-hmm. And so my feeling about the ghost bike is that it's not necessarily giving the message that may be intended, like drive slower, be safe. It's... it's um, it feels to me like it's more of a, a, a negative message that if you ride a bike, you might get killed. And since it's so near Fairfax School, you know, if I had a little kid who said, hey, what's this? Why, what's this bicycle? Why? And I think it would be um, a deterrent to that child wanting to ride a bicycle because it would be deemed as unsafe. And um, <clears throat> just as a a personal story is that my late husband was killed on a bicycle by an unfortunate, um, you know, collision with a truck, not in Cleveland Heights, um, on Music and 44. Um, but he was, he bicycled every single day um, before he went to work at John Carroll. He was an environmentalist. He was a biologist. And um, so I'm really sensitive, of course, but I don't, I just want to pull that away from the fact that it's not like I drive by that ghost bike every day and go like, oh, you know, it, it's not a personal, it's sort of informed by my personal experience, but it's not super sensitive to it. So I just wanted to kind of put it in perspective that I think there's a lot of really positive things we can do to encourage people to ride bicycles and children. And sometimes when you give the the negative message instead of the positive one. Like just recently, John and I have been talking about littering, for example. And um, do not litter is not as effective as protect our parks. You know, so let's let's think about how can we give a positive message. So, anyways, I I don't have bolt cutters <clears throat> to take the bicycle down, and I respect the family who lost their loved one. Very, I 
you know, can certainly appreciate that. Um, but I think after four years, maybe we could put up a <clears throat> more positive message than a ghost fight. So that's my, my request. Could it be a memorial plaque? Could we... A tree, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah, is there room for a tree there? No, it's actually on a, it's, it's affixed to a stop sign, I believe, yeah. which probably isn't legal anyways. But. Perhaps you could talk about that in one of your meetings. Sure. Um, I think uh, right now it's there with, uh, um, I, I think the main uh, people who have been consulted have been the uh, homeowner uh, of uh -huh. the property, and that's the person who um, authorized it after the, well, both, the person before, like, who lived there, and then the person who bought the house afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I think it has been revisited since. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we can talk about that with people. And then approach us to talk to, yes. to direct coordinator yes. Wayne mm -hmm. to um, see if he can do something as yes. well. Yes. It's excellent. Mm -hmm. So it, it might be beneficial to you know, look at the messaging around that yeah. and to see if, um, you know, usually... Um, the person, you know, like in case of uh, my coalition, might have a way that you thought the message will come out versus how people might see it. And so um, maybe this is not the only concern, but maybe we can look holistically at the messaging and see if we can uh, capture it more. And then maybe put some more information on there. Yeah. Um, you know, we talked about it, uh, you know, coming from the in quote, negative end or the positive end where you say don't do something versus do something. something. Yeah. So we can look at the message yeah. around. And this is a very sensitive area just because it's a hotspot for <laughs> for accidents yeah. in our uh, sure. city. Mm -hmm. And um, it's uh, it's actually an area that people do want to bike to. Mm -hmm. um, if you ever get to walk there on a, on a week there on a Sunday and you go by the stone oven, that's packed. The bicycle parking, mm -hmm. yeah. the little bit that exists is packed mm -hmm. uh, at all times. Same, well, same by Phoenix. Uh, and such. So people, there's a lot of interest in, in the, that particular uh, area. Um, so yeah, Lee Road, which we live off of, mm -hmm. is a really congested place. Yeah. It's not. It's not a happy place for pedestrians either. No. Yeah. You know, because they've narrowed the sidewalk. The sidewalk is narrow, and the the uh, tree lawn is you know half the width of this table. And mm -hmm. so yeah, the whole. Lee Road, and then the ruts, and you know, it's a mess. <laughs> I could mention briefly, but let me commend you guys for doing such an excellent job with yeah. promoting biking. Uh, here at the city, we prioritize uh, bike biking, uh, particularly uh, as, a, as a carbon mitigation tool, and we're looking at expanding more of that and how we reduce vehicle miles traveled. Because when you look at the carbon emissions profile of the city, uh, the energy sector, like any other, urban space is always dominant, you know, with energy, uh, with electricity usage, natural gas usage, et cetera, being the dominant uh, sources of carbon emissions. But then when you look at transportation as a whole sector, which is next, where you're looking at public transit, on-road transportation, off-road, you know, with uh, lawn mowers and all of that. Uh, but then one of the key ways we reduce vehicle miles traveled is by promoting uh, other modes of transportation. And so that's where the biking, you know, uh, as, as a huge tool or resource, you know, features prominently. Um, another thing I want to mention is the, uh, we talked about the scooters and, you know, those bikes that, you know, because sometimes they, they tend to be uh, maybe a nuisance with where people drop them off and all of that, but they play an integral role with connecting, you know, other modes of transportation and bringing it all into that holistic picture. But I think, um, you know, it's worth having some conversation around, you know, where people leave them and if you leave them, uh, at a place A, you get some credit, you know, some discount from your next ride and things like that, how we incentivize that type of thing. Because it's not only, um, you know, here in the city that I see this, you know, I see that in Kent State University, you know, which promoted that hugely, and it's also recognized by uh, friendly campus. But then you have, uh, you know, typical college town feel where sometimes people leave, leave these bikes or scooters anywhere because once they are done, it served my purpose, I drop it off and I go. Yeah. But then, you know, we want to incentivize action around you know, getting some credit, you know, for your next ride when you put it at a designated spot, you know, which usually, you know, tends to get people, um, you know, doing that because people want to, you know, <laughs> want something for the action, you know, of a sort. So, um, but, you know, thank you. I think this is excellent, you know, with promoting this as I take out, please.
And I do have about 45 minutes left, so I want to give each of you, as the biking population in this room, an opportunity to, I would like to know what your favorite ride through Cleveland Heights mm -hmm. is, where you would take on a Saturday when you're not going to work, let's just say. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in your case, Cameron, it may be because you're going to work, maybe the section. That's your favorite part of your ride through Cleveland Heights. That, that makes you nervous and feeling unsafe. And also, the third is, at that point where you feel unsafe, what infrastructure change could make you feel safer? So if I could ask you for that personal information, I really, I'd love to hear it. So Angel, go first, please. All right. All right. So uh, this is kind of freaky. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and therein lies the problem. Yes, yes. So uh, favorite part, uh, my favorite route when I'm just doing nothing is just uh, going up and down uh, the city streets from east to west and coming uh, back and forth. So uh, going down uh, North Park is great. Uh, getting all the way from Euclid Heights, I'm, I'm sorry, from uh, Edge Hill towards, um, um, uh, towards Coventry, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, all the way through um, Washington Boulevard, um, and that area is, 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 is a, it's an easy way, it's accessible, and if I have other people who are riding with me, it's easier to take them through there because I feel like it's safe. Now, uh, I meant to say, well, when I said that it was tricky, it implies that, let's say that we're on North Park. Uh, there's some conflicting signage there that uh, some people, uh, resulting people kind of parking on the bike lane that exists there. Uh, that combined with some debris kind of makes you exit uh, impromptu the bike lane when uh, cars see you out of the bike lane sometimes they get a little bit angry and aggressive and they're also not expecting you to so it becomes a little bit of a trap especially for least experienced um, riders so that's a complicator uh, my other least two areas to ride would be along um uh, Monticello, mm -hmm. uh, that is supposed to be yeah. slower than it should be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and people do uh, do drive there very fast, yeah. uh, sometimes close to fifty miles per hour, mm -hmm. and uh, it kind of blocks the city on a north south divide. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, if I want to go through the Forest Hill area and uh, all of those neighborhoods, it's kind of difficult to get back to <laughs> home. Um, and then the other one would be, um, I don't know the name of that neighborhood. It's basically the area uh, of Taylor, between Taylor and San Frans, kind of uh, just behind Ongers. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another area where people that's unexpectedly... Round Blanche? Is that Round Blanche? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Unexpectedly fast. So, uh, and there's a lot of stop signs, and yet people drive consistently over 35 and 40 there. That yeah. Street. So those are my least favorite areas in the Climate Heights. I think the signage is something that we can definitely look at. Uh, speeding is something that the city is yeah. working on as a whole. Yes, Joe? Just to specify, on the south side of North Park, there, there are signs that say, uh, bike lane, no parking anytime, mm -hmm. and then 30 feet later, there's a sign that says no parking uh, for certain hours, but it's like midnight to 6 a.m. or something. <laughs> um, if you go there on a busy weekend over by the lake, uh, there's always cars parked on the south side of right in the, any uh, afternoon, actually, <laughs> right in that bike lane. So then it yeah. causes people to swerve around dangerously into traffic. Uh, so yeah, that's certainly a problem area. Oh, so the cars are violating the bike lane. Right. Well, it's it's, it's unclear confusing. from the yeah. signage oh. because there is signage that says this is a bike lane, no parking at all, and then there are signs that say no parking during the hours of midnight to six a.m. Oh. or whatever. Is so, that Lower Lake? Yeah. Okay. You know, I mean, there's definitely some uh, planning that could go around there that could increase parking for the people who want to you know, park and then walk around. Right. I mean, there's, you know, we've seen some plans that it would be great to revisit. You've probably seen them too, to revisit to, to, 
so that there's parking for people that isn't on like North that. Park. Sure. Yeah. And Joe, that, that section of, of North Park is on the city's priority list for 2024 reconstruction, sewer, road, yeah. uh, repaving, but sewer work as well. Mm -hmm. This is an ideal time mm -hmm. to say, let's also completely recalibrate the signage mm -hmm. while yeah. that Yes. Well, Can you advocate for that from. when you're in those meetings? Absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, what we don't want to see is uh, uh, two conflicting signs. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> well, and you can't blame people if they sure. flip the <laughs> coin and decide which one it was. And my understanding, and you can actually, if you go back um, in Google Maps, uh, time view, you can go back to 2007 or so. There's no bike lanes there. Mm -hmm. Those signs that say midnight to six, no parking, are there. And then the bike lanes go in at some point in 2012 or whatever. Yeah, they didn't. And they never moved the signs. Yeah. So the sign, yeah. those old signs are still there. Mm -hmm. So they just need to be removed. Yeah. Um, you touched on this, but I think another kind of like, I think of this as low hanging fruit that the administration could prioritize to uh, help promote more biking uh, along North Park and in some of the other areas where we do actually have um, dedicated bike lanes. Um, the the debris and um, and even in the winter the the they're completely blocked by by snow. They, the plows typically uh, plow the snow into the bike lanes, and then in the fall and now um, they're covered with uh, oh, lawn yeah. debris and leaves and all that. So it it also you'll have a it also leads to having a dedicated bike lane and then all of a sudden you're swerving in and out or there's, you know, big sticks and logs and all that stuff. So um, Cleveland Heights has, it has great bones for promoting, um, you know, biking. It's, it's somewhat dense. It has an approachable grid, um, connected streets. Uh, we have some decent bike infrastructure with buffered bike lanes. Um, I would say Edge Hill is another one uh, coming up from University Circle. Uh, very often completely clogged with um, with dirt and debris and then also tree limbs uh, jetting into that area. So along Edge Hill and then definitely North Park is consistently problematic. When we did buy a second, we were supposed to have a second sweeper and I don't know when it's going to arrive, but, the, but that was conversation during budget season mm -hmm. that we wanted to make sure that the bikers were you know, anybody, I mean, even a car, if you've got something big like that sticking out, it could be dangerous. So sure. that's been why we budgeted that second sweeper. So hopefully we'll see sweepers in our, all of our neighborhoods more often. And I would mm -hmm. say, I I don't, I don't think Cleveland Heights, the edge hill, part of edge hill that goes down into Little Italy. Mm -hmm. That's Cleveland. Yeah. It, it makes me really, really nervous when I've got a bike around my right and when I approach that curve going in there. So mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any coordination that can be made between the cities, but man, to try to give that biker the three feet they need plus to negotiate having a car coming right at me, it's just mm -hmm. been really difficult. So Cameron, your favorite route. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, so my favorite route, I might be a little broad here, but, you know, I think one of the, the strengths of Cleveland Heights when it comes to biking is just the amount of low volume residential streets throughout the city okay. that does feel very comfortable to ride on, regardless of whether or not there's any bike infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I love just being able to go on those more residentially focused streets and just take in the architecture and the tree canopy and, um, you know, some of the reasons that people decide to live in this area, right? Yeah. Um, one area that's I would say one of my favorites, but then also my least favorites, depending on the situation, <laughs> um, is, you know, Ron had already mentioned, but but North Park. It's, um, you know, I take the bike lanes on North Park every single day that I bike into work. It's an incredible um, piece of infrastructure that I'm very grateful for when it's working in my favor. Um, in addition to the signage that he brought up, but another thing that I often face is on the north side of North Park, um, there are often uh, landscape companies that park in the bike lane that are servicing the houses and uh, you're, you have a similar situation where you have to weave around them and merge into traffic going 35 40 miles per hour and so that just creates a you know a very unsafe conflict potentially for cyclists and cars um but when it isn't blocked um i love it it's it's great <laughs> um thinking of other things um 
you think of Cedar Hill, there's a off-road path that goes down into University Circle, which looks lovely. And I'm sure a lot of people would love to use it, but it's very hard to access and actually use it in any meaningful way. Um, I think that's due to there not really being a good connection on both ends. So once you ride down that path into University Circle, you're just kind of like left at a very dangerous intersection and sidewalks. Um, and you kind of have that similar situation up at, at the top of the hill where you have that intersection of Cedar Hill and um, was it High School of Art. Yeah. Cedar and Paramount. What could improve that? How would you? Because that's just such a. Yeah. That, anyway. That's a good, that's a good question. I, <laughs> uh, just I study it, maybe try to figure out a better way. Yeah. And I don't know what the solution is, but just like a better way to actually get people onto that path. Um, Especially if you yeah. could detour into into like more easily into Ampler Heights mm -hmm. without having to take uh, such a sharp uh, you know turn, <laughs> that would be easier. Yeah. yeah, but I think before we before we get it improved, it's it's an ideal example to use of what a car friendly or car focused or car dominant city does to other modes of transportation mm -hmm. is that egress and Right, egress, egress and exit from that path going up and down the hill, yeah. both ends, mm -hmm. says, if you're not a car, good luck. Mm -hmm. And so it, to me, it's a classic example of if you want to show somebody what what can be wrong, it's classic. Yeah. And uh, just one thing that we haven't touched on is that a lot of times as we, so we, we use this uh, infrastructure for biking, but it's very common to see people uh, in wheelchairs trying to use this yes. because sidewalks are not, not uh, friendly to yes. them, right? So helping uh, cyclists with uh, this uh, infrastructure is inherently helping all these people who are in wheelchairs, whether they're motorized or not, uh, to move around the city and connect places. Sidewalks are another big, huge issue now. Um, Kelly needs to, excuse me, needs to leave, but I would like, she's got a comment she'd like to make. Um, I've said this a couple of times, but I think the right people are in the room. I am from Colombia. Um, I grew up in Bogota. Very dangerous, difficult place. A lot of poverty. Um, in the late 70s, um, the mayor decided that to change how people connected as a community, to bring happiness into the community. He did one single thing that really changed so much, and I was there to see it. It's called the Ciclovia. Mm -hmm. They close, and, and, and I hear you talk about North Park, and I hear you talk about all these beautiful sections of our city. But there are sections of our city that also deserve to have mm -hmm. access, equitable access to this lifestyle. So it's not a complicated issue. Basically, once a month, you will close a thoroughfare. I think about Monticello or Monticello, however you guys pronounce it. Mm -hmm. It's got two different sections. You don't have to close the whole thing. You just close half of it, you know? And what you do is you invite the community on a Sunday afternoon, maybe from 10 a.m. to 4 o'clock, and come out. It's like a huge block party. It's like a block party, but what you do is you start inviting people to ride their bikes. Maybe not everybody has a bike, but they can walk, or they have skates. It doesn't matter. They just come up. The reason why we struggle in this country, because we don't have a mentality of, we are built to ride cars. This is who we are. We're, we are we are wired to be in our cars. Most countries in the world are not like that. Most countries in the world, yeah, they have a great public transportation infrastructure, they walk or they ride their bikes. They just know that people can't afford buy cars. Part of the survey, as I'm reading it again, I'm thinking, yes, we want to put the infrastructure out there and that's gonna help. But there is more to that. There is this sort of like rewiring of our brains. 
and how do we think about um, making different choices, you know? And, and I think by developing maybe a test, you know, for maybe a year of allowing people to come out and, and communities that normally don't get the attention. I just read a fabulous book, um, and it talks a lot about how LeBron James, what he does is he gives children bikes. He is creating this uh, culture of community, uh, health, um, thinking differently about how we you know, move around. I would love to see our city host once a month in an underserved part of our city a cyclovia. And that's where the mayor can come and shake hands and where that's where the fire department can be there. You know what I'm saying? It is, but it, it happens every month on this day. And people start, you, you build it and they will come. That's how I would like to leave it. So. Thank you so much. That's a fabulous idea. Yeah, my usual. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Cleveland did this, I want to say 2018, yeah. 2019, and they called it Cyclevia. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, how did that go? Uh, I wasn't um, I, I wasn't involved then, um, so I don't I didn't I participate, but um, in a number of different neighborhoods across the city. I think um, Open Streets is another uh, well, framing for it. You guys it. have that, not you, but I did. Northeast Ohio has the community, like 2,000 bicycle goals, like Monday nights. Oh, um, slow the, roll. Slow roll. Yeah, yeah. It's so well attended, mm -hmm. you know. It's telling you, people want to connect. Mm -hmm. But they vary from cities. Why well, we have one in our city, you know? I would love to be able to just test how that sure. goes, bringing people together, people like us in neighborhoods that we normally don't go to. And then do the same for other people. And that's also a great way to uh, give people who haven't ridden a bike in a long time a that's chance right. to ride it on the safe. street and feel safe <laughs> because they don't have to contend with cars and traffic and all of that. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry, guys, I have to go to the um, downtown. <laughs> it's all right. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, just to finish up, do you have a favorite route with your yeah, family? Yeah. <laughs> So um, I would say uh, I do most of my writing now um, with one or two kids mm -hmm. uh, in tow. Um, and my um, favorite ride that I would say in Cleveland Heights would be um, either up to um, Forest Hills Park um, or sometimes I will just go for a ride that includes um, Kane Park, Cumberland, um, Forest Hills or up to the community center. There is actually, um, going back to what we were talking about of the, um, like the Cedar Glen path, it's like this beautiful path and then on either end you're kind of uh, wondering what you're supposed to do here. Um, there's the makings of a really beautiful um, off-road uh, trail network mm -hmm. from Forest Hills Park and the community center um, down through Cumberland Park um, cross Euclid Heights Boulevard and there's a little green space um, that isn't utilized for anything. There's um, where? So it's basically between Cumberland and uh, <coughs> Kane Park. Yeah, we, we, call that that, we, we call that schoolhouse. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah we've okay. just sort of given it that name. Schoolhouse Park. Yeah. Um, really high potential oh, yeah, area. Yeah, 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 yeah. You could yeah. continue, there's there's a trail that stops right there um, and and then picks up again on the um, Kane Park, on the entrance to Kane Park on the Lee Road side. And then you can take that through Kane Park and then you're down on Taylor. Um, so, you know, you have a couple playgrounds, you have yeah. the, the pool, you have the community center, um, you have everything at Kane Park. Um, we go up and go hiking in Forest Hills. So there's so many. Uh, Is that the things. trail behind the pool? So yeah, there's a pool. There's a trail yeah. by the pool. Because I was looking. It's just fresh in my mind because we're looking for the dog park area. Okay. To play something. And okay. we're looking at that yeah. green space back yeah. there by the 
uh, swings, and I okay. noticed it was a trail. There's back a trail there. there. There's a, yeah. a beautiful trail there. Yeah. Um, there's a section right in the middle where um, Schoolhouse Park. Is that across um, the street? That would be, I guess, southeast of like Euclid Heights. Is there a water? Uh, yeah, that's the Dugway. It's the Dugway Brook it's that's been cul there. yeah culverted. Culverted. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's just a green space mm -hmm. right now right. Um, that the city could do something really spectacularly with. Yeah. There is a trail along Cumberland, which is the route that I take, um, but it's it looks like it was maybe put in 30, 40 years ago and hasn't mm -hmm. been touched since, so um, could use some help. Um, and it's also, you really have to know uh, where each of these things are. It's not obvious that if you wanted to get from, say, Kane Park to the community yeah, center, yeah. that you can navigate this little this little pathway. Um, the, the challenge there on the, um, the south side of that little green space um, schoolhouse park um, along Superior, uh, there's nothing. There's not even a um, sidewalk for the most part on the north side of Superior between Lee and Euclid Heights Boulevard. And so if you're coming from um, like the Cedar Lee area north, um, you're going to hit Superior and then you have to figure out, okay, how do I get across this little green space or go up to Lee and around. So there's a there's a short um, section there where it's actually pretty precarious because you have pretty high speed um, traffic on Superior <laughs> and quite quite high volume, um, and then you're really mixing in with traffic and trying to you know get in front of cars and stuff like that. So that would be um, that would be the challenge of that route. Um, I'm really excited about. Um, what that could become. Yeah. And that's part of these planning uh, processes that we've talked about. Because if you can connect, um, you know, Forest Hills Park to Kane Park and beyond, you're really, that's like a, a spine right through the middle of the city. Our assets, yes. Yeah, that then you can connect to from either side and then really take that um, east west. Um, so I, I think that can be something really spectacular. Mm -hmm. It has the makings of that. And I can, vision it, but uh, it's not there yet. Um, Could I interrupt you just for a minute on that? <clears throat> um, we're with um, Friends of Heights Parks, mm -hmm. and we're really looking forward to the city's um, budgeted planning process for the parks, mm -hmm. because we see that's all the Dugway Brook, mm -hmm. you know, and we see this as a park. People think of, you know, each um, park as mm -hmm. being unique, which they are, but we actually have a park system mm -hmm. of 140 acres. Mm -hmm. So um, I recently wa uh, reached out to um, someone in the planning department to talk about mapping, you know, because just like the metro parks, um, it would be great for each park to have a map and then to have the grand, the grand scheme. And mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a prototype map made that was very similar to the uh, model that the Metro Parks used, mm -hmm. which, you know, we're all familiar with that, I think would be so helpful. Um, but now it's sort of like been, now they're working on this internally, I mm -hmm. think, before they bring it out. But I think I, I, we would be so, you know, supportive and leading the way for that uh, bicycle, pedestrian friendly mm -hmm. um, opportunity to really get involved in the natural areas of our parks, not just for baseball and mm -hmm. recreation, but, um, you know, more passive recreation. Sure. Mm -hmm. So we're hosting um, a number of walks through the park. We did last uh, summer, and we're doing it again monthly just to get people in the parks so that they would value them more. It so thank you for that. Yeah, and I, I'm excited because being, you could start at Forest Hill Park mm -hmm. if you were living north of Monticello mm -hmm. in um, some of our areas that don't have a lot of bike access, but if you, we could plot a safe trip mm -hmm. for people on side streets to get from their neighborhood along Noble over to <coughs> Forest Hill Park and then be able to enjoy this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring this to an end. Does anybody have a last couple minutes they want to contribute? Or I, I Thank you so much. Good I wasn't sure how we were going to do this today, um, but I feel reassured that there's a lot happening for your coalition and you are involved in it, which is really what I was also concerned about is making sure that you were part of everything, Joel. Absolutely. And thanks for having us. Yeah. Um, to reiterate a couple things that we had talked about, I think there's, there is some real low hanging fruit yeah. in terms of 
uh, improving the maintenance specifically of uh, the uh, bicycle infrastructure that does exist. Mm -hmm. um, that can that's just something that needs a little bit of attention. We've already done the work to you know have these um, in some areas, but really just the um, the maintenance of that could be uh, improved. Okay. And then the longer, more strategic things, uh, specifically from council, would be. Um, looking forward to those two planning processes to yeah. come before uh, for approval. Mm -hmm. And then um, this fall and going forward, uh, really prioritizing the, the funding of the build out of those networks. Because yeah. we have, it, you know, a plan could be great, but if we're not really dedicating the money to, to make it happen, mm -hmm. then it's just going to sit there on the shelf. So those would be the two big things. Um, to look forward to. And you're going to send us some information. Yeah, and I'll just pass these out. Um, uh, the first one is about um, safety and specifically uh, speed limits um, and how how speed impacts um, uh, yeah. death rates. So, um, you know, this is uh, just a little schema that shows uh, at 23, if a pedestrian or a bicyclist hit at 23 miles an hour, which is supposedly the speed limit in our residential areas, but um, very consistently it's traffic is much higher, um, but a 10% risk of death getting hit at 23 miles an hour versus at 42 um, miles an hour goes up to about 50%. So it's really an exponential climb um, when you start getting above, uh, you know, 20, 25 miles an hour. Um, so I will just, I'll, I have a couple copies of this that I can pass uh, out. Um, this is, again, just the, um, this is the summary page of this report, but I will follow up and send the entire Thank report. Um, and then there were two others. Uh, one is on how, um, biking and modal shift from cars to bikes and supporting that can be a really impactful um, climate change and climate uh, resiliency um, tool for cities specifically. And then the last one was just um, the economic benefits of supporting um, bike infrastructure, specifically what you were referencing previously about, okay, you can get down to the coffee shop, can you lock up your bike and go inside and get a sandwich or a coffee? Um, so there's uh, certainly some economic uh, benefits to this as well for, for local cities and local businesses. So I'll stop there, I'll follow up with the full reports. Thank you so much to everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Don't forget to email us uh, at every event. We got it. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for your time. Really Absolutely. It. I'm going to adjourn this meeting at 11 12.